name is Jenny, and I'm a wife and mom raising two kids. But I used to live a more glamorous life as a TV reporter. I was on the nightly news interviewing pop stars and politicians. So when I said goodbye to TV and hello to motherhood, I suddenly discovered what we moms are up against. We live in a world that tells us to be rich and famous, thin and successful. You know, almost nobody says, oh, oh hey, you're a mom? That's fabulous. But you are fabulous, and I'm here to tell you why. It's the Channel Mom Show, celebrating you with Jenny Dean Schmidt. You are listening to the Channel Mom Show, where we are celebrating you, Mom, on Mile High Sports Radio. We are Mile High Sports, AM 1510, FM 93.7. I'm your host, Jenny Dean Schmidt. Now, first, before we get to our guest, it's going to talk about some great things. I want to just tell everybody and invite everybody to something wonderful. You don't just get one day a year, Mom. Wouldn't you like more than one day, Jolene? <laughs> I would like a day off or two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll take a day off. Somebody else will cook for you. Channel Mom and Chick-fil-A, the Chick-fil-A in Lakewood on uh, Wadsworth and Bellevue, are going to be throwing something really neat and new. I've never heard of it before, so I'm really excited we're doing this, called Celebrate Mom Day. We're going to do a live show on November 5th, starting at 8 a.m., and then we're going to have all kinds of wonderful prizes and games. I've already, um, one of our sponsors has already donated about $800 worth of prizes. So there's going to be some really neat stuff. You can play games with your kids. You can eat. I will celebrate you. We're going to take your nominations for Mom of the Year, and we're going to have a Channel Mom Mom of the Year. Isn't that cool? That's great. Yeah. Are you going to come? And I love Chick-fil-A. <laughs> yeah, I do too. Are you going to come? November 5th. Commit. November 5th. November 5th. Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks, Jolene. All right. We are now going to talk about Culture Shock, a survival guide for teens. It was put together by Julie. Now your husband says this differently, but Hiramini. Hiramini, is that good enough? That's okay. Good. And the Generations of Virtue team. Julie travels worldwide talking about the issues of integrity and purity in our children and teenagers, and she gets into the really difficult, tough stuff. Most of us don't want to talk about, but probably if we did, we could save our children a lot of problems. That's what the research shows. You are a wife and mother of five, yes, five girls, correct? That's correct. And founder and executive director of Generations of Virtue. Okay, we're going to, before we talk about the Generations of Virtue and the book, what is the biggest threat as you watch your girls grow up? You have five of them. What's the biggest threat to teens in our culture today? Well, I feel like our kids are growing up in a world that it's even worse than when we grew up. Mm -hmm. And so they're encountering things that we didn't encounter in terms of media and technology. So I think some of those things coming, we as parents need to be on top of them. So we're walking with our kids. We're helping them out through it. We're not just leaving them and saying, here, go for it. See how you do. We're going to walk through it with them and committed to walk side by side. Sure. Okay. The book is Culture Shock, a guide for a survival guide for teens. I have read through it and has some amazing lessons in it. Uh, about how do you get your kids through this stuff. I think most parents throw up their hands and say, look, they're going to watch what they're going to watch. They're going to lose their virginity at 15 or 16 because that's just what people do. I, I have a lot of mom friends who just put their girls on birth control by the time they were 15 because they just gave up. They're going to, you know, every once in a while they may receive a sex. I, you know, that mm -hmm. means texting that involves sex if people don't know out there. They may get cyberbullied. I think, I, I think there are a lot of parents that just don't know what to do. And the other thing I think a lot of parents don't realize is the research shows if they just did approach the topic, it would change their child's attitude. The child actually listens. They've proven that children will put off having sex if their parents ask them to. But if you don't, they'll, they'll say, well, nobody's asked me not to. I guess, you know, I'm getting pressured and I might as well. Right. And I think parents can start when their kids are really young. We have to start a lot younger than our parents did with us because mm -hmm. oftentimes our parents waited and now we have to start in preschool equipping them with age-appropriate messages on how to handle things. And then as they grow up into their teen years, I think there's four things we can do as parents to really help them. One is connect with our kids. We need to be connecting with them on all different levels, not just on this, but paving a way so that we're able to talk about these things in their lives. Mm -hmm. And then set clear expectations. What are your expectations for your daughter or for your son? Yeah. Next, set some boundaries for them that they can walk in. You need to be their protector. And yeah. lastly, if dad's around, a father's involvement is really key. Well, and Jolene has a preschooler. How would you, how would, how would you talk to a preschooler? If you're trying to set the stage for, we don't want you to get somebody pregnant when they're 15. We don't want you to be sending <laughs> sex because all your friend, guy friends are. How do you set the stage at four years old? At four years old, it's perfect. Because then they're so... They want to know everything. Mom, how is a baby made? How does it get in there? How does it come out? That's always the question we're afraid of, right? And so if we can talk to them just at that point, how babies are made, 
and what we believe. Like I tell my kids, this is something that I want them to save for marriage at that point. But hold on, at four, you're telling them how babies are made? I waited till third grade or fourth grade. But now I think we have to do it. You, there's great books out there that parents can Seriously. use to talk to their kids. And you sit down just like another story. You know, you read this to them, right? And so this is another story. But the whole thing is, is we want to be the primary source of information. In this day and age, by kindergarten, they will find out from the kid at school or the kid down the street. Uh -huh. Don't you want to be the primary source of information directing correct information to your kids rather than what they get the thought of telling Cameron how do you feel about that that scares me <laughs> it's, it's scary yeah I don't know I guess I'll need to get that book <laughs> <laughs> Jolene well here, this is the reason I invited Jolene on I cannot wait for this conversation to ensue because Jolene's a realist and and I love your book and I support it and I'm already working on my children and saying look it, it may sound fun I know that everybody's is doing it supposedly um but I want you to consider what this means, what this does to your life, how you must view your future wife if she's doing the same thing as you, how you must future view your future husband if he's doing the same thing as you. It, it research shows that in the end, people do regret those kind of relationships if, if they've had multiple relationships. But Jolene is a realist and says, you know, so have it at happens. it, Jolene. <laughs> Here's a woman on my left who's saying, we really believe that you can keep your child pure until they get married. What do you say to her? What's your biggest question? I would like to hope that would be true, but reality is it's probably not. I mean, I, I maybe wish that um, my my father's talk to me on it was don't get pregnant. And then at 17, I got pregnant. Um, so it didn't matter. Okay, so he yeah. just said don't get pregnant, don't get but he pregnant. didn't that say don't have sex. That was our talk. <laughs> don't get pregnant. Okay. What if Do he not. said don't have sex? Oh, I, I was a rebel Teenage yeah. punk, so I didn't care what my parents said, unfortunately. Um, but maybe if we start younger now, and because they help. didn't start young, no. When did he tell you that? Don't get pregnant. When I was sixteen. Okay, uh -huh. and then you just yeah, I didn't listen. So what do you say? What do you say to somebody who's like, look, my dad said don't get pregnant, and I got pregnant at seventeen. Well, and I think as parents, you know, we have to get over that. Just don't have sex. I mean, unless we're going to help our kids with an intentional plan to do it. Now, I realize there's different backgrounds we're coming from. There's different places. And so I have a faith-based belief that I want my kids to wait until they get married. And that is something that they are carrying with them. But either way, we want our kids to wait longer than they are now because there's so many pitfalls. Absolutely. If we can get our sons and daughters to put that off to where they're more emotionally mature, then that will be much, much better. Yeah. I mean, do you not think? And, and, and yes, I've led my kids to, to try to understand that God created them in a beautiful way and they don't need to just give that away. Not everybody's there. Not everybody's, not everybody follows the Bible or, or believes in God who made somebody in a certain way, okay? But don't, doesn't, don't you think, just, just like I've said before on this show, I don't think any mom wants their child to be an atheist. I, by the same token, I don't think any mom wants their child sexually active at 14. Yet they don't know what to do about it. And so, because we have a culture that says, it's all good. Look at Brittany. Look at... Well, and peer pressure. Mm -hmm. It's, it's so much, so much peer pressure. But, but my, my question is, how do we make that inroads into what they're hearing from the culture? Movies, songs. I mean, songs. Mm -hmm. When I was growing up, that's, that's, that was in some ways what was most convincing to me. Because of the romance that was going on in songs. Like, yeah, I want some. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Seriously. Because of what they're being said in the songs. So... So what is the difference? I mean, you're, you have a 17-year-old who is, if you don't mind my saying, still pure. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference? How do you get a child to say, yeah, I really want to treat myself in a certain way and I want to look upon my future spouse in a certain way, that yeah, I really don't want to be throwing it everywhere. So tell me right. about that. And I, and I would say the difference is working with them on an intentional plan by the time they're 11. What's an intentional plan? And reevaluating that all along. Well, you know, there's stuff about telling your kids about the birds and the bees. You know, we want to do that when they're younger. But at 11, why do we say to our kids, what's, what's your plan going to be in this situation? There's a lot of ground to cover. Even between hand-holding and having sex, there's so much going on with oral sex and different things. Mm -hmm. There's so many dangers to that for our kids. And I don't believe in just making scare tactics, but I believe in them seeing the reality of the situation. What is the fruit going to be in their lives? Are they? I want a strong, successful young woman to grow up that's not that's going to know what she wants. And so to make a plan with her about, okay, how am I going to draw the line? What am I going to do? My husband is an awesome protector. 
of his daughter. And he actually, um, we heard one lady say to us one time, well, I give my daughter business cards. And those business cards have my husband's name on it or my name. And so when someone asks her out on a date, she hands the guy a business card, says, call my dad. And if the guy has enough guts to call her dad, then, you know, there's going to be some discussion there about maybe they can go out. But the whole idea is that we need to step in and walk with them and be some protecting factor as well as helping them set some standards for themselves that they're going to own, not just that it's mom and dad's standard. So, Julian, do you think there's a, a fear about being intentional like that? Like, how do I do that? How do I walk up to Casey when he's 11 and say, all right, bud, here's the deal. Here's what we want for you. I mean, do you think there's some fear about? Absolutely. And tell yeah. me what, what are you afraid of? I, I, you know, I don't know. I, it's just, it's the whole thing of just them growing up is scary. So maybe parents would rather just be like, ah, la, 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 one, no, two, three. No, you have to have the talk. It's just a matter of when. And, and you were right, Julie, getting to them before they hear it from their friends is mm-hmm. key. Right. Right. But, Apparently but I, I need guess to get she, on the ball on that. <laughs> yes, you do, Dara. Um, <laughs> I've got some great books and, <laughs> and so does Julie. Um, you know, what? I think what you're saying is it's not just the talk. It's you continue to, to walk them through their life and say, okay, so what does this song mean to you? Or what does this movie mean to you? Or when the, your friend is now sexually active, what is that? What are you thinking about that? How does that make you feel? And so-and-so just got pregnant. What, how are you viewing that? I mean, are you talking about that just constant in their lives conversations? Right. It's real life conversations of what they're encountering, what they're looking at, the media to know kind of what media. And media has an influence. There's a study released in November 2008 that the media that they watch and the songs they listen to, they will go out and try that within two years, whatever those things are talking about. And so are we able to balance some of the media coming into our homes? Are we able to balance the technology is a huge one for parents because I'm no techno whiz. But I've had to kind of learn so that we can walk together and I can be a little on top of things and say, you know what, that's a dangerous conversation you're in. You might not know that person or they're saying things that are bullying you or they're saying things that are inappropriate. And so just that we keep tabs, it's, it takes time. I know. And do you think parents are too busy? Like I cannot constantly yeah. be monitoring my kid's phone or my kid's internet. I know, but we have to. Right. And uh, do you believe that they can or do you believe parents are too busy? I believe parents are extremely busy, but you have to make the time to do that. You have to know what your kids are doing at all times, period. Yeah, what's the end game that you would tell them to look at? Like, if you don't do this, what's going to happen in your child's life? I mean, I think sometimes they'd rather just be like, what, plug their ears, one, two, three, four, five, I don't want to think about this. What's the end game if they don't? Like, the, 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 the child could end up in perversion or porn or... or right, I mean, there's, there's huge things with technology. Pornography is a huge one. You know, and another one is just all the things... At, 1960s one in 50 people had an std now it's one in four and so we just you know there's so many things that our kids are encountering that are different and growing worse than it was when we were so we want them to be prepared isn't it one in three teenage girls i believe that has an std i think i heard a survey that i know it was just under 50 percent it was they a lot of us STDs. Yeah. Between a quarter and a third of all teenage girls were getting STDs. Right. And it's not just because they're having sex. I mean, it can be oral sex. It's all these different things that they're encountering. They're like trying to skirt around the issue, but it's not, it's still happening to them. Well, and let me say this, I, and, and we've only got a minute and a half, but I think that what happens with any parent, we're all guilty of it. We just think it's overwhelming. I just, I'm just going to pray and hope it's not going to happen. <laughs> but, but how would you feel if your child got an STD? You know, welcome to STD. Welcome to poverty. If they're a teen parent at age 15, there's going to be some poverty in their life. Welcome to some perversion. There's going to be perversion in their life. Welcome to sadness. Welcome to heartbreak. I mean, all these things, but it could be alleviated if we just talk. And we've got some other people coming up now, and I'm loving this. These are two teenagers. One who kept, I'm I'm sorry, they're in their 20s, but in their teens. One kept herself pure, one did not. And they've got some really raw and real stories and some statistics to back it up. And I also can't wait for Jolene to get a chance to talk to them too. Please join us when we come back with two lovely young women. This is the Channel Mom Show you're listening to. We are celebrating you. Please join us when we come back. I'm bleeding inside.